Afternoon, everybody. Um, hello, and um, thank you first and foremost um, for everybody uh, for your attendance today at um, what hopefully will be an exciting um, session in terms of finding out either a little bit more about social value or perhaps reinforcing some of what you already know about social value. So, first and foremost, thank you to you for uh, your attendance today because without your attendance, we wouldn't have um, you know the the event. Um, to, to, to be sharing their time together. My name is Steve Sandcock. Um, I act as the chair of the Southwest Procurement Board, and as part of the workings of that board, we are keen to try and um, bring into the Southwest region, region events and activities that will, um, if you like, share learning, offer best practice, and distribute more information from. Um, a range of related topics um, within the procurement, commissioning and contracting world. So uh, today's session is, uh, it, it, like I said, I'm delighted to see so many faces in the room from not only um, local governments in terms of public sector, but also services such as the police, fire and rescue services, CC, uh, CCGs in terms of health ar arrangement and also um, universities within a, and across the region. So, like I said, in, um, you know, we've got a great broad base of um, participants involved. As you may have noticed, we have had some technical issues in terms of getting the IT up and running, which hopefully we're now going to be uh, moving forward within a, in, in, the, in the right way. Um, some first, first and foremost, some housekeeping rules. Um, no fire drills are planned today, so if the, if the fire alarm does go off, then it will be the, the fire exit is out through and down through the stairway. Um, must a point outside, um, outside of the building in a safe manner. Um, please can I also ask that if you've got mobile phones, use your um, drill if you can put them on silent. Happy and relaxed if you wish to take a call or um, need, to, need to go outside to take a call, please feel free to quietly go out and equally if you if you wish to um, you know have, have a coffee quietly move forward and help yourself to a tea or coffee at the back. Toilets are again down through the stairs and then and then back through the building into the back uh, quarter of the, the, the building there. We will be looking but dependent on how we go with agenda we, we may be sort of 10 minutes late in terms of finishing our aim is to finish by four o'clock. Um, if if the, if we are finishing um, slightly later than that and you need to go because of taxis or trains or things like that, please feel free again to, um, you know, sort of quietly move, move out and things like that. We won't, um, we won't be offended. I mean, obviously, you know, if by 2.30 we have nobody left in the room, then we might have to re regroup and rethink on that. But I'm sure with the speakers that we have today, we certainly won't be in that position. Um, and also, just to make you aware, I think in terms of the information pack that was sent out, we are looking at recording this session today. And with that in mind, um, it will enable us to then share the learning, share the discussion, share the debate, and hopefully then broaden, um, you know, broaden that out further. But if there are any particular reasons why you wouldn't want to partake it or be, or be in, um, part of that um, ed final edit, then please can we either let myself know or let Jacqueline know, and then we can then certainly let Carl know um, in, in, in to, to make sure that your wishes are respected in that. We've got delicate packs. I think those delicate packs, if you've not got a delicate pack, it might well be um, now is the time to get one, because we may well be referring to those in the immediate future, um, as opposed to the, um, the, the white screen behind us. So if you, if you haven't got a pack, um, can, can you please indicate that and we'll, we'll look to get you a pack accordingly. Lovely. Sorry, Jacqueline, could you, could you, um, sorry, who, who's not got a pack? So, gentleman there in the corner. Okay. And, right, thank you. Um, but those, those, those um, packs will be there. I also, we'll look to then um, get those out to those who have attended today in electronic form. So, as to the programme um, today, the background to the events is a little bit of more around the Southwest Procurement Board. What, we, what we've tried to do is um, bring useful, relevant discussions and into the Southwest region. And this is really, a, a, again, I think an ideal opportunity to learn from 
three eminent um, experts in the social value world around their experiences of, of, of social value and also bring that into some degree of practical outputs as well um, as, as to that learning. Um, we also have a panel from Bristol um, who are going to be here to give us more information as to how the Bristol experience has been and the work that they've done on social value. So, I mean, in terms of the Act itself, the Act was, um, um, came into being in, um, uh, in 20, uh, 2012, and the foundations um, for public sector to ensure that um, in terms of how we deliver our services, that social value um, considerations, whether they be economic, um, environmental matters, or, or um, uh, and the, um, social considerations are taken into account in terms of how we commission services, how we tender those services, and how we ultimately deliver those services. I'm sure each and every one of us will have different experiences in terms of how that has been um, put into reality. Um, and I'm sure that will also drive some of the questions that come forward um, as part of the, session, the, the timings that we have to um, debate some of those points um, this afternoon as well. But, but hopefully the aim of the workshop will be to further um, get us to an understanding, um, an understanding and an approach across the region. It will also allow us an opportunity to share some um, best practice and knowledge from across the region and also to, un to, to gain an understanding as to how, um, how we can sort of take forward some of these items into, into, um, into what we do in our in day-to-day uh, -day business. So some of the questions that I would expect, um, you know, that, 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 that may be around the table, so, you know, what does, what does Social um, Value Act mean in practice? What are the relevant considerations that we need to take into account? What um, you know, proportionality do we need to take into account in terms of how we implement it? And how do we make, um, know if it's making a difference? And I'm sure that from the conversation and the discussion in this event, we will, we will learn a lot more um, about that this afternoon. So, first and foremost, I'm pleased to, and delighted to welcome three eminent speakers um, to, to the Southwest. Um, I hope you've all had safe journeys to us. And, um, like I said, we, um, firstly I'd like to introduce Margaret. Margaret is, um, and please do correct me if I've got um, wrong CVs or wrong bibliographies in respect of any of this, but Senior Policy Advisor for the Cabinet Office. Um, Margaret has, um, it sees her role very much as providing a strong link between central government, the southwest region um, and public sector in and across the southwest. And Margaret's um, experience ranges from um, policy and innovation work within public sector, but also working with the voluntary sectors um, in the past. So I'm delighted uh, for you to be with us, Margaret. Um, today also we're delighted to welcome Guy. Um, Guy Battle from um, the Social Value um, uh, Portal, and Guy is CEO of Social Value Portal. And I believe Guy had a busy day yesterday in or around Westminster in terms of the launch of the Social Value Toolkit. Yes. And again, we'll learn more a little bit more about that, I'm sure, as part of Guy's um, session today. And I'm sure, um, hopefully, you all will have um, been flooding Guy's email box with your responses around um, the initial look at the toolkit as well. So, uh, so um, thank you, Guy, for that. Guy's background has been very much built on um, a strong foundation of sustainability in terms of um, building and uh, building and um, looking at sustainable considerations um, going through his career as well. So, welcome to you, Guy. And Carl, um, Carl, but, but, sorry, I, I knew I was going to struggle. That's all right, Belazare. Belazare, thank you, Carl. Um, apologies. Um, Carl again brings a, a, a vast array, array of experience um, in terms of social value. Carl, um, you're a managing director, as, uh, as um, I believe, of Social Enterprise Works, and you support in terms of developing social enterprise in terms of their initial growth stages through hopefully to success and flourishing stages. And I'm sure Carl will be able to bring some first hand experiences to how social value is, impacts. Um, in and across um, how um, public sector and voluntary sector work across the piece. 
but Carl also, also has listed a range of social value interests from human rights to poverty alleviation, ch children and civil rights um, considerations as well as, 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 as his interests. So um, I think those are the um, main points to um, pick up for now. And without further ado, I would like to, um, like I said, pass um, over the mantle now to Margaret. Um, and, and hopefully, Margaret, we will have some okay. slides, but if not, we may be looking for you to talk to your slides, that's, if that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank um, you, Margaret. Everybody's got the pack, haven't they? So you've got the slides in there, I believe. Do you want me to stand, or is sitting okay? Sitting's okay. I just, I don't really... You should stand. It's quite nice just to sit down and talk to you as we're having a conversation rather than my presenting at you as such. Fantastic. Um, so as, as Steve said, interestingly Steve introduced me as working for the Cabinet Office. Um, I work for a, a, a sub-department which is called the Office for Civil Society. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, just out of interest, have any of you heard of the Office for Civil Society? Thank you. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's interesting in itself, probably because of your procurement background. Um, have you heard of the Cabinet Office? Yes. Okay, that's good. Have you heard of DCMS, Department of Culture, Media and Sport? Yes. Um, just interesting for you to know, and it's a good branding thing from a government perspective, the fact none of you have heard of OCS, interesting, I'll take that back, park that as an issue, but just um, be aware, our, my department that I work for, and I'll, I'll come on and explain a little bit more about what we do, um, when Theresa May came in as our new Prime Minister and had a reshuffle, overnight I moved from working from the Cabinet Office to DCMS. Those things happen when you're a civil servant and that's just life. So I actually now work for DCMS, although my email address is still the Cabinet Office because the IT tech and everything else takes a little while to follow. Um, we still have the same minister who is Rob Wilson um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So my first slide, um, you'll see a picture of Theresa May there. And the reason I've added that, I just thought it was helpful just to reflect in terms of context. Um, we still have a Conservative government um, and the Social Value Act came in under the previous coalition government, which obviously was Conservative and, and Lib Dem. Um, and Although we still have a Conservative government, the thinking behind social value is still very strong, still key. It's worth just reflecting that we have a new Prime Minister and who has already made some strong kind of policy statements in her introductions, her standing outside number 10. Um, and her mission is to make Britain a country that works for everyone. And I think that's just worth thinking of and reflecting when we think about social value. Um, and what does that mean to her, an economy that delivers for all? And you can see the things that I've put on the slide there. Um, I just think we're, central government is reframing its policy in terms of um, Theresa May's thinking. Um, still very much core themes are still consistent as they were before, but the, the concept of inclusive economy has certainly been cited in some of her early speeches. Um, and from a central government perspective, it's worth thinking, being aware that we're looking at that. So the Office for Civil Society, what do we do? Interesting, none of you have heard of us. Um, we do a lot of work. Have any of you, how many of you have heard of the Commissioning Academy? Okay, that's good. That's a few more. At the end of it, I'm hoping to get a room where everybody puts their hands up. Um, so we've worked very closely with the Cabinet Office around the Commissioning Academy. Our core remit for the Office for Civil Society um, is around increasing social in innovation and creating and building a stronger civil society. Let me ask you another question. Does the terminology civil society mean anything to anybody? Do you know what that means? Couples. That's good. Thank you, Bristol City Council. I'm pleased you're <laughs> on the side. Um, what about the third sector? Because we, the Office of Civil Society was rebranded in 2010 when the Conservative government came along, and prior to that we were the Office of the Third Sector. So if I'd asked you the question at the beginning, had anybody heard of the Office of the Third Sector, would anybody have put their hand up? Couple more, that's good, we're getting better. Great. So the core role for our department is to support civil society. Um, we do that through work around supporting philanthropy, volunteering, community activity um, and social investment and social business um, and 
particularly around youth um, social action as well. There's four, three core policy strands overlapping there. Um, high level outcomes, as I've talked about, um, and our work around social value is core to that. So our department was the department that supported the Social Value Act through legislation and supported Lord Young with his review of the Social Value Act. Um, because I've got a room full of procurement experts, I'm going to take advantage of the fact you're here, um, and it's not necessarily directly related to social value, although I think they're very closely linked and interrelated. Um, We've done a lot of work around social investment and social impact bonds, and I was just interested from a procurement and commissioning perspective, how many of you know anything about social impact bonds? Another show of hands, it's a bit like show and tell. Okay, that's interesting in itself. I'll park that, but I think that's really useful from a government perspective. But social impact bonds are an outcomes-based commissioning model that government is looking to develop a lot further. We have an 80 million life chances fund at the moment which provides match money for local commissioners if you're developing and seeking outcomes. Um, current strands of activity around drug and alcohol dependency in children's services and in 2017 we're going to have strands around young people, needs, youth employment, youth justice, early years, healthy lives and older people services. So if you're working with commissioners, they might start to increasingly consider whether a social impact bond is an option um, or a way of commissioning services. So you might not know much about it now, but let's park that conversation and we we'll maybe another another theme for a future event. Okay, so let's go back to social value. Okay, as Steve said, the Social Value Act um, came into force in January 2013 and it requires commissioners to re consider through their procurement how to improve economic, social and environmental well-being of communities when procuring public services. That's what the Act says. Um, it's around, it's a tool for commissioners, procurement experts to work with their commissioning colleagues to secure greater value for public money. It's around how can you gain extra benefits in your local area. It's around maximising impact of the money you as a commissioning authorities spend. So what's the potential for the Act? Um, it's around maximising value for money, as I've talked about, and it's around creating local innovation. Um, depending on your perspective, some of the criticism of the Act is that it, it provides too much freedom. I think from a government perspective, we would argue that actually that's one of its benefits, that it provides you as local um, commissioning authorities the freedom to innovate locally and identify the way you want to procure and identify local needs and local services through your procurement. Um, so the opportunity is to redesign commissioning approaches and create wider benefits for your communities. Um, but social value is a whole lot more than just the Social Value Act. That's the legal tool behind it. It links into the discussion I was talking about around the inclusive economy. Social value enables commissioners to show, secure better outcomes and as a consequence to address some of the tricky um, social problems or challenges you might have in your area. So the Social Value Act review that was undertaken as an independent review by Lord Young in 2015. Um, he looked at the evidence, did a call out, and his key findings were that the Act has had a positive effect, um, that the variety of organisations engaging and being involved in the Act, was, his, in his words, was striking, and he was excited about the Act's potential. Having said all that, um, the variety of recommendations uh, Lord Young put to the Minister of the Cabinet Office, um, and that was through the barriers and issues his review had identified. So some key barriers were around awareness and take-up of the Act, that's very mixed, um, about a variety of different levels of understanding, inconsistent practice, um, about how to understand and define social value. What does it mean to you in your local area? What does it mean within your commissioning or procurement processes? Um, about debunking misinformation and misunderstanding, I think there's a lot of myths around the Social Value Act, particularly in line with EU legislation. Um, and how that fits in with the legal, legal procurement and legal procurement frameworks um, and clarifying its role within pre-procurement. 
So as a consequence, he had three key areas of recommendation. One was we need to increase the awareness and take up of the Act. Um, we need to be better aware of how to apply the Act. Uh, and we need to improve how we measure social value. So in terms of supporting the implementation of social value, government has done a number of things. Uh, we had in spring last this year the first social value awards which identified and brought um, and if you're interested in the organizations that applied for those awards and the case studies that came out those awards are all available on the cabinet office and social enterprise uk website um, so there's an increasing body of evidence um, and examples of where different authorities are using the act um, and some of those were given accolades through that award process um, we've also, through the Cabinet Office, funded, um, a, through small amounts of funding, eight implementation and measurement projects, again, to address Lord Young's identification that we needed to do more work on this, um, and those are being published as case studies between now and the end of the year. Two of them have been published and were published last week. One of those, um, Guy will probably talk about a little bit more in detail, was with his work with Harrow Council. Um, around um, assessment tools in renovation of council properties. And the second one that's been published was through Kent County Council around their framework and the use of social value within their adult social care commissioning. Um, there's a Southwest example that will be coming out. Partners in Devon have done work around social value and healthy lifestyles project and some others around the country as well. Um, other work that government's been involved with is a bi-social campaign which links in with Social Enterprise UK uh, and there's a corporate challenge for corporates working nationally to look at their, could, they're not bound by the Act but how can I engage and buy socially in the same way that um, the Act um, asks uh, local authorities and public commissioners to do so. Um, other examples in the southwest, I know Dorset from, from my, some of my outreach work have embedded the social value policy there uh, and they've done um, a couple of case studies around some of their work. They've got one around social meals um, and they're recommissioning their school meals um, service. They identified, I think all of these are probably giving ideas for commissioners and procurement experts. What do you look for? So in Dorset, for example, their school's meals contract um, as part of the added social value that contract delivered for them, it was um, training within the kitchens for school pupils, um, particular training around the care leavers um, and gaining care leader apprenticeships with the catering providers and sourcing schools meals provision in terms of local food sourcing. All added benefits that their use of the Social Value Act enabled them to deliver into their, into their contract and economic benefits for Dorset as well. Similarly, their home improvement commissioning gained extra social benefits, um, training through star skills and some local CSR, um, corporate social responsibility um, uh, pledges from, from the commissioning authorities. There are an increasing number of examples out there. Um, a couple of years ago, you may well have looked, you know, how do we do this now? There's increasing more examples that you can learn from. And obviously our colleagues in Bristol are here to demonstrate and show you some of that too. So, in terms of progress, um, moving to, to my last slide, Social Enterprise UK have been a partner with government in some of their work, but equally, you know, a good challenging partner. They, they did some interesting research earlier this year through um, Freedom of Information and approached all the local authorities across the country to do a mapping of what was going on in terms of adoption and engagement with the Social Value Act. Um, and I know Guy did a quick feeler for so Southwest um, um, adoption around social value earlier this week, so it would be interesting to get that feedback. But in terms of the uh, national survey that Social Enterprise UK did earlier this year, the Southwest comes across as one of the poorer areas across the country. So you could take that as a challenge, or you could take that as a kick up the bum. That's up to you, I guess. Um, I think it's helpful to understand that benchmarking. So in, within their research, they identified four kind of strands. So there were those that were empowered by the Act, 
um, and they classified those as em embracers or adopters, and the, those authorities that just would consider the act as a new duty. So instead of openly embracing it and moving forward, they classified themselves as compilers and bystanders. Um, so in terms of the South West, the South West we came across as 24% were either embracers or adopters, and that's local authorities of all types, districts, counties, unitaries, um, and then 76% were classed as compilers or bystanders, whereas if you compare that, for example, say to the North East, in the North East, 63% are embracers or adopters compared to the 24% in the South West, which is why I was, you know, maybe that's a challenge, maybe the South West does need to improve. That's for us maybe to think about and discuss a little bit today. Um, so in terms of learning, I think social, the Social Value Act is still very much in its infancy. We are three years into a new piece of legislation. Um, there's a lot of early work out there, but still hopefully the, the survey I've just referred to indicates there's a whole lot more to do. Um, it would be interesting, what would you consider your, and, and I think you know, Guy's work, that the responses you've given him to uh, earlier this week will help to identify this, but you know, which are you? From your perspective, would you consider your authority as an embracer, an adopter, a compiler, or a bystander? Um, and I won't put you, ask you to put your hands up, because that might be a bit mean, but um, I think you know, it's something to reflect on. Um, similarly, from a, from a government perspective, uh, Lord Young's review two years ago suggested that we need to review this from a government perspective again within two years. That's coming up. I, uh, within my policy remit, have been asked to this, consider that. So I would be really interested in some of our questions or debate today. What more could government do? What more should government do? Has it done enough already? Is there more support that government could provide? Really interested to have that conversation and that debate um, with you. But I think that's about me. Thank, Thank you. you. Margaret. Thank you very much. Um, we've got an opportunity for questions at this point. We'll also have opportunity for further debate as well during the course of the afternoon. Does anybody have any questions for Margaret at this moment in time? Come around the table. Ma Margaret, could I, could I just ask one question? Please you, do. You, you, you set the conversation up in terms of obviously the, 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 the direction that Theresa May is yeah. um, putting um, forward in, in very clear sort of public speeches, both from day one and also subsequent conversations and discussions that she's had. Do, how, how do you see that influencing um, the Social Value Act and the, where, where it goes from here? Obviously, with also this pending review coming up as well. Um, I think that's all part of the review. I think the Social Value Act will still be core to activity. Um, I think it provides actually the opportunity for the Social Value Act to be stronger. Um, it's you know it's not necessarily my place to, to say that, but I I do think you know it's core to the work that we can do to support that inclusive economy agenda those local authorities that are using the social value act innovatively are seeing and gaining extra benefits for their communities through their commissioning processes um, and they can use that to address their local economic challenges sure. you know link all that together one response to the other yes. you know. okay all right thank you thank you margaret <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you, um, Margaret, very much for that. Um, hopefully you'll be still able to join us for some questions and kind of debate later. Um, and now we're, we're um, out further ado. Lovely, thank you, by all means. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, what a relief, Dr. Has to show really the PowerPoint slides, it's great. <laughs> uh, but I, I shall use my slides as a prompt, although I'm not going to follow them precisely because this allows me a certain amount of freedom, which is a uh, good news. So, um, it's no problem if you're a bystander, by the way, it's okay. It's just started the Social Value Act. Yes, um, I didn't mean to be we, we call them followers in our, in our view, um, but it's fine to be followers. And I'll, I'll come back to the results in a moment. And a lot of you are followers at the moment. Um, and that's, I would argue, because there's not a lot of guidance out there. So, when you, know, you ask the question, what does good look like? Um, and you look to the Act, the Act has no answers to that whatsoever, other than to say it's 
environmental, it's social, and it's economic. And so, for me, it's hardly surprising that um, the public sector as a whole is kind of struggling with this. Um, and what we've been trying to do <clears throat> at Social Value Portal, and also as part of the task force, is to provide a structure and a framework that will help you guys. It doesn't say you have to do this or have to do that, it's just a framework, and you can dive in anywhere, um, and you can start anywhere, and you can kind of progress to anywhere, anywhere you, you want to be. Um, first off, let me just explain a little bit about the Social Value Portal. So I set up the business a couple of years ago, just around Lord Young's review, just before it, in fact. Um, and it's principally a platform for um, measuring social value, um, for procurement, and for reporting, for you guys uh, at least. Uh, and from a measurement perspective, we'll help measure the value of a particular project or outcome, if you like. Um, and then procurement, we've got a bid platform that we're working with a number of clients at the moment, so people like Southwark, um, Birmingham, um, uh, Manchester, and then uh, a host of others we're working with. We're, we're using this as a procurement platform, and the reason why that has become so important and why measurement is so fundamental, because if you are a procurement officer, you've managed this sort of £2 million job, and everyone's submitted a social value submission, and you've got a weighting of, let's say, 10%-ish, how do you compare one solution to the other solution in an objective manner that is defendable and robust? And so our solution that we've developed um, is really about all of it, is about that. It allows you to have a, a number, ultimately, that measures social value, so you compare one bid uh, to the other. But more importantly, you can also talk about the value, the additional value that this particular project and you as the commissioning procurement team have delivered as a result of this, uh, this project. Um, and plainly this is important because the challenge ahead is big for you guys. I mean, you've already faced this 40% cut. You've, I don't know, you've probably got another 20% cut. And when I talk to my private sector colleagues about this and say, look, can you imagine having to face up to a 40 to 50, 60% cut in your in the money you get, your revenue, they, they kind of fall off the chair. And actually, bizarre, it's not really well known that that's what you guys have faced out there. And I, I, I'm shocked how you even managed to stay afloat with these sorts of numbers flying around, because 10% is fine, but you know, 40, 50%, that's like a major shift, major change. So you kind of need all the help that you can get. And I think that, for me, is sort of part of our mission, and it's a personal mission as well, to some extent, is how can we, through you know, so, well, the work we do, support you to deliver the services that we know the community wants? Well, what I can do is help drag business to that table. I can help drag third sector a certain amount, but I can engage business because I know business really, really well, having been in it for so many years. And I'm saying, look, you can't just win a job with you know, this price or the lowest price or whatever it is. You've got to do more. You, you've actually got to do more to win this job. You can't just sit there passively and get work off the public sector and say, fine, I'm making money, I'm paying my shoulders and walk away. That's not any longer any good because the public sector is screaming out for support. And actually, so we're saying to private sector organisations that you know, let's have social value as a point of competition, and that's your role. And if you make it a point of competition, you'll find that um, uh, the businesses who are bidding for your work will compete, of course, on price, but they'll also compete on social value. And they'll, they'll, be, they'll compete to be gooder, better than the next door neighbour. Because if you set a 10 or 20% rating for social value. They'll give you a good price, but actually they'll also go that extra mile to, to deliver additional social value for you. And so those are the kind of principles that we follow. Um, and I should say, the Act, from our perspective, is a revolutionary piece of legislation. It quite amazes me that the uh, public sector hasn't really grasped this yet, the opportunity this Act provides. Um, it is loose in its, in its language, and you could argue that's why we're behind, that's fair enough, but actually the looseness provides a massive opportunity for you to interpret almost a social value almost as you wish. And it is it's such a strong piece of legislation in that respect. And it's not in the Social Value Act, the PCR 2015, backs you up 100%, so you can do it through OGO as well. There is absolutely no problem at all um, to, to kind of demand what you want from an environmental, social and economic, as long as you are not specific 
You've got to think proportional and you've got to think relevance. And those are two words that were brought up earlier, and these are fundamental when you are going through your procurement. And I'll just talk in a moment about how you might get around that. But plainly, there's an issue that people worry about. I'm buying tables and chairs. Can I ask for you know, apprentices? Well, you probably can ask for apprentices. But can I ask for additional social value? Well, yes is the answer. You can. It doesn't have to be precisely relevant to the contract as long as it's defined by your organisation within your social value policy. So you, as officers, you need to be thinking about how you define it sort of in the broader sense. But what I can say is leading local authorities are, are delivering an additional 20% social value on all their procurement. Um, they are um, working cross, um, cross department, cross directorate, and they're also beginning now to work into planning. So they're actually beginning to unlock value with planners. And just, let's just step back a little bit to that 20%. Um, and that's additional social value. So I understand that roughly speaking, in Southwest, the total procurement spend is around about two billion of that order, so I'm told. But let's say it's two billion, it's fine. 20% of two billion is 400 million pounds. So that is the size of the cross. It is really, really big. And we've got evidence to show that we're delivering it. So in Harrow, just finished a procurement job, um, the, the highest additional social value that, that someone offered was 57% on a £1.3 million job. Now, some of that was about local spend. If you strip that out and think about all the extra piece, then actually it was about 30% additional social value. We've also just delivered a project with Berry and Barclays. And Barclays just kind of blew us out of the water. They've gone for 80% additional social value. So they've identified a whole lot of additional issues they wouldn't normally offer. They're offering it to Berry. Berry's a big prize for them because Berry buys them into Association of Greater Manchester. So when they get Berry, we also get lots of others up there. So that's kind of interesting. So they've got that extra mark. So there's some real opportunities here that you need to uh, be, be thinking about and un unlocking. But the question is how you measure it and what's, how you define social value. And this gets to the core of it. I think, um, and where you guys need to start. Um, and just stepping back slightly, so social, economic and environment is the definition, the triple bottom line issue. You can ask for anything around those, those elements. It doesn't have to just be jobs or local supply chain spend. It can be a whole lot of environmental stuff and a whole lot of economic, I mean, what, it can be almost anything as long as you define it. Um, but what's important about a social value assessment is, yes, you're interested in a job, but actually a social value analysis says who gets the job and what's the value to that society of that individual getting a job. So, for instance, on the one hand, someone from a well -off, relatively well-off background might get a job. On the other hand, a young offender might get the same job. Plainly, that um, person who lives with the family might be a young graduate, was never going to be a particular burden on society. The young offender is already a burden on society, and actually, as a result of getting a job, they reintegrate into society, they're off benefits, they're out of the young offender program, they're saving money on, on, um, uh, uh, on all the support around them. Those numbers, unit cost database, cabinet office, difference between £2,200 a year and £34,000 a year. Now, that £34,000 a year is a real saving. It's a fiscal saving and economic benefit. And what's interesting about that number is that Margaret mentioned the social um, impact bonds, payment by results model. 34,000 per young offender is what the government, Treasury, would be prepared to pay for each young offender off the book. So we know those are pretty hard numbers. And we know they're probably slightly pessimistic numbers as well, or low numbers, because the Treasury never overpays. Uh, and that's by the by. So what you need to be thinking about is how you define social value in the broadest sense. And we talk about a set of themes, outcomes and measures. And some of you might already understand this language. Themes being your corporate themes might be, you know, uh, growth and jobs. Or it might be cleaner, greener, Cornwall. Or it might be, um, you know, a healthier, safer, happier community. I mean, those are triple bottom line. You get a set of outcomes. The outcomes might be fair pay or climate change reduction, and the measures will be tons of CO2 or 
number of young offenders engaged, employed, local supply chain spend, we then will put a value to that, or you can put a value to that. But that's part of our work, when we work with local authorities, we put a value to it so that you can then sum the total social value by looking at all those measures uh, and assess them. And so that becomes your tool and that gets embedded into the procurement processes. So um, we've done that, we've done this at Harrow, we're doing it at Birmingham, Manchester, various other places. We basically have a set of opportunities for business. It's just a list in principle. Um, you put a value against each of those items and you declare the value to your bidders. You don't tell them what to do. You don't say you've got to do an apprentice. You don't have to say you have to save a ton of CO2 or whatever. You just say, this is how we define social value in the broadest sense. If you can get cabinet to sign that off, or your executive, that puts you in a really strong position, then that way you get around the issue of relevance and you leave the decision about proportionality to the supplier. The supplier, the business, knows what is proportional. They're not going to put money into a young offender program if they're going to lose money overall, unless they think it's going to support their business. So you want to allow the business to, to compete and also you want to allow the, the business to... Um, uh, to sort of decide what they want to do and what's relevant and what is proportional and indeed um, how they're going to win the job. And we found on the project that we've been working on, we get some really interesting solutions. A lot of innovation around that, but some real opportunities um, when you make it like that. So that's kind of working the best practice. And best practice is now drifting into planning. And the reason I mentioned planning as well, because... I'll just take, um, let's take Hamsmith, where we're working with at the moment. They spend 300 million a year on procurement. So plus 20% is that uh, 60 odd million pounds. But, they, but the developers spend around about a billion pounds a year in redeveloping bits and pieces of Hammersmith and Fulham. 20% on that is 200 million pounds, which is almost the same as the procurement budget. So if you can get into planning, then you're really beginning to make a, a massive impact and mass, massive difference. But that does mean that, as local authorities, you've got to talk to each other and across departments. And I know that's challenging at times, but beyond that, the even better, that's a very annoying thing. Beyond that, and even better, um, you should be talking across all of the local public sector bodies in your particular area. So local thought councils talking to uh, emergency services, talking to um, uh, health CCGs, you've got money to spend. Why don't we have the same set of themes, outcomes and measures that you're all buying to? There's only reason why CCG money and buying a, you know, a piece of cancer a, a measurement equipment with Siemens can't actually, why can't you demand social value from Siemens to be spent locally? There's no reason you, you can't. I can tell you legally you can. So why aren't you doing that? And if you're joining up, then that becomes really quite an interesting issue. So in just the last sort of five minutes, I'll just go through the um, work we'll be doing is the uh, Social Value Best Practice Task Force. So we got together with a series of uh, uh, local authorities, emergency services, so London Fire Brigade as well, um, some CCGs, Halton CCG in particular, uh, back in February. We asked the question, what does good look like? And out of that came the framework. Um, and then the framework, which some of you have seen, I think I've sent it all, it's been sent to everyone. Um, there's two parts to that, well, there's, there's a series of sort of parts to it, but in principle what we have is um, a set of sort of themes that we've talked about, which are things like governance, which is uh, contract management, those things that you have to do, that you measure, and then we've got different sort of scales, if you like, on a journey, follower, um, a mature leader, and then finally innovator. And really the idea is not for us to assess you, but for you to assess yourselves. And then what's important about that is you say, where are we now and where do we want to be? And if, if as officers, you can then get your councillors, your members, to sign that off, in particular where they want it to be, then that actually begins, gives you your journey. Because you'll say, this is where we are, councillor, you tell us where you want to be, and there you've got your journey mapped out. And so what the tool also does, it, it also produces an action plan as well for you to use internally however you wish. So 
There's two types of tool. There's the quick tool and there's a fast tool. I ask you to do the quick tool just to get a sense of where you're at. Um, and that was kind of interesting. But please do go to the web. There's a, we've got a website that's in the pack where you can download the tool and you can also submit it to us and we're going to compare across the country. There's two documents also on the website now. Um, that one is explains the how to use the tool in a bit more detail and it also has sector commentaries because at the moment we've got a tool for local for councils and a tool for suppliers we don't have a tool specifically for ccgs or health and nor do we have one for emergency services but we've got sector commentaries that help will help you apply that but we'll be developing those over over the next period of time now just in terms of the straw poll it's, it's changed slightly because we've got a couple of late latecomers, but uh, it doesn't really matter. What, what's kind of interesting about this is that <clears throat> as a region, you are generally follower and a few of you are mature in certain areas. And you can kind of see where those are. There's two sets of graphs there. One is the average of everything and the other is the individuals. But as a group, collective, you're saying you want to be um, at least mature or leader, and in fact some of you are saying you want to be innovator as well. So everyone is kind of saying you want to move up, which is the right place to be. And I know it's the right place to be because you'll, you'll deliver more value and you might even save money as well. So if you're not doing it, it really doesn't make sense at all. You've got to ask why you're not applying this amazing piece of legislation. Um, but there's sort of a couple of things that are worth noting in that, where some of the biggest jumps are. There's a big jump in measurement. How are you going to measure? Of course, we can help with that. Um, there's a big jump in contract management. Uh, I, a lot of you think you're not doing it particularly well at the moment, and you want to do it better. And that's not surprising, because that's a general sort of malaise, so to speak, across all public sector bodies who struggle with contract management. Um, and I think the, the other interesting one, I think, is around measurement uh, and then around reporting and governance as well, in particular, where a lot of you think you're followers at the moment, but you want to get to mature leader. So <coughs> our, hopefully the, um, the framework will, will provide you with those sort of steps and this is a journey, as I say. It's a journey that you're not going to achieve overnight. Um, it will take some time. There will require a bit of resources on it. I mean, it's not necessarily money to be spent, but it's allocation of officers' time. This isn't just going to happen if you just... I mean, you've got to... Someone's got to help develop up the, the themes, outcomes, and measures of the Tom's framework. You've got to get your policies together. You've got to then implement it in procurement. So if you're not doing that, then nothing's going to happen. Um, but I can tell you, business is getting really frustrated. They're saying that we're doing this stuff, and yet so many local authorities aren't asking for it. So why are we bothering? So you've, you've, last night we had a few businesses there last night, and you have an open door, an absolute open door. Um, you've just got to create a level open, transparent playing field. And I think transparency is really important. Um, one of the, we did a survey of suppliers a couple of years ago, and one of the biggest frustrations around social value was that, apart from everyone's doing it differently, uh, the other piece was transparency, saying this isn't a level, level playing field. So as a collective group, what I suggest is you kind of agree as much as you can as a group to make it Anyone who's working in the Southwest is kind of knows what they can expect, and there's no reason why your themes, outcomes, and measures can't be kind of similar. And follow the same protocols in terms of transparency and communication with business. And that way, you're going to unlock a, a lot more. And that, for me, is really what this is all about. Yes, the Social Value Act takes a bit of time for you guys. It won't cost you money. It will not add costs to projects. We have found absolutely no evidence anywhere the bidders are adding costs to your projects. Quite the reverse, actually. Um, and I can show you a whole lot of case studies separately if you're interested to prove that. Bidders are, suppliers are out there, they want to do more, so create a level playing field. Um, but the Social Value Act and everything around it, I think offers an amazing opportunity for you to re really sort of, um, sort of turn on its head how you go, how you, how you re 
we established the relationship between you guys, public sector, business and civil society. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much for that. Um, would, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to um, talk through with Guy at the moment? Welcome. Uh, so I think it was a fascinating look in terms of um, understanding the journey um, that, that's there. Any, any questions from the floor? More, more, more work to be done. Guy, um, question in relation to the planning aspect, and we spoke briefly before, um, before the session began, and um, you, you were mentioning the, connect or the connectivity between, you know, do you look to influence social value through the planning considerations? Yes. Um, I'd be interested to just understand how or where that potentially has worked at the moment. I think you mentioned Hammersmith and Fulham, but what, what, what in particular have they done differently around social value in terms of planning? So, um, most of you will have heard the Section 106. Yeah. Yeah. So, Section 106 is the, the one lever that a local authority has to get extra stuff out of a developer. They've got, you've got the community infrastructure levy as well, but that's kind of that's, a, that's just a formula now. It's you know, eight pounds a square metre, and that just goes off, and that goes to labor, you and labour frauds. But the Section 106 is, is designed to mitigate the detrimental impact of a development, and it's the negotiation of cash, ultimately. And whilst it's coming down a bit because more is going to sill, it still exists. Um, and developers, generally speaking, try and make it as little as possible, naturally, and your planning teams, naturally speaking, we're trying to get as much as possible because it's income for the local authority. Um, and what happens is that there's a big argument, planning is delayed and it's all a bit of a mess to be honest with you. And the only real losers are the community because no one actually, no one wins whatsoever. And yet that money is meant for community. And so what we've done at Hammersfield and Fulham and in fact Chelsea Football Club as well, who we're working with, is get the planners and the developers to think about the community. Think about the outcomes, put a value on the outcomes, and then negotiate backwards. Don't worry about the cash at this point in time. Just think about the social value that's being delivered as a result of the development. And then that changes the whole nature of the conversation. Then the conversation is around which body is best placed to deliver that particular outcome. Is it the local authority or is it the developer? And in some cases, Senator Chelsea, the local authority is no way going to get the impact on young offenders that Chelsea Football Club is going to get. I'm just not even, not even going to touch it. So Chelsea said, look, we'll do this. You know, we kind of absorb the cost, but we're going to do it. And actually, you know, the value is big for, for Hammersmith and Fulham. And young offenders is a key issue in Hammersmith and Fulham. So that's what I mean by the planning. So you need to shift that discussion. Um, and then if you could also include um, how the occupier of a building engages with the community, then the sort of values you're talking about are actually, they are easily 30% of the development cost per year. Because of course, every year, I mean construction is just one, one piece, but, but occupation is 30, 25, 30 years. And then suddenly the occupier becomes part of the community and you put a value on that. So that's really where... Okay. I've got a quick question actually. Yeah. Um, you mentioned one of your examples there, um, Barry and Barclays, uh, and that Barclays put in place some really innovative things, especially because they saw this big <laughs> pot at the end of the rainbow. It's a massive contract, I'm assuming. Um, great it's a framework. framework. It's a framework, yeah. So, so it's a huge value to that. Do you find then that this reflects down in smaller contracts, SMEs, are they as engaged, or is it just another sort of opportunity for the larger, more corporate organisations who understand how it works, who understand how public sector operates and, and kind of the pot of gold that's there for well, all these sure it's but it's interesting, you're teeing up my presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So there is, a, there is a risk that the big guys might just bend out of the social value act, but I don't think that actually is a risk, and nor should it be. So Harrow have set a 100,000 floor above which social value is part of it, below which they're going to ask you general questions. If you go to Birmingham, it's 50,000. Mm -hmm. In some places, it's 20,000. And plainly, there's no reason why a social enterprise 
in its core business because the social enterprise doesn't just bring social value. Mm -hmm. And actually, it doesn't cost a social uh, enterprise. It shouldn't cost it more to deliver additional value. Someone like Barclays, we know, probably has to do spend money to generate some of the programs because their core service might not be like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, in truth, the jury's out still, I think slightly. Playing the big guys can see the big prize, and so they're likely uh, to go there. Uh, but I think as uh, procurers and commissioners, you, you need to be cognizant of that. Um, and I'm sure Carl will have some solution for it as well. Yeah, interesting, because we've obviously got that push to uh, operate and contract as much as we can with SMEs and support that, but then it, it starts seeing the other way again. Yeah, it's the, whole the only other thing I will say, manage it's a, um, so especially where I'm mean, working, I know Wilmot Dixon, let's say, construction company, um, what you can do is think about matchmaking. Mm -hmm. So you tell Will and Dixon, or you put the bid out to all these companies, say look, plus we're, we're, we're making a premium marketplace for you of all sorts of suppliers who are small suppliers, and we're, going to, we're expecting you to engage these people, and we're going to reward you based on you know, the social enterprises or the third sector providers you're, you're engaging within your supply chain. So on the big contracts, there's actually no reason why you can't get a lot of social value and local small businesses engaged be coming to build the market capacity for that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you for your question. I think it leads quite it up really nice. fantastically, <laughs> Carl. I mean, you're yeah. scripted <laughs> if it was. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to stay put, if you don't mind. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carl Benazette. Uh, Managing Director of a 23-year-old development agency supporting social and community businesses based up in Bristol. Um, predominantly supporting and serving the west of England uh, and a bit further afield. And interestingly about the question, because from my understanding and from my personal take on things, that the social value act, one of the aspirations was to level the playing field for social and small organisations. Uh, and particularly with relation to the Bristol um, City Council's um, uh, dedicated social value policy, SMEs and um, voluntary community and social enterprise organisations have been identified as priority groups. So within the Council's um, core policy, they're being identified and um, targeted as such um, to be benefactors of. Um, the adoption of the Social Value Act within Bristol. Before I jump straight into that though, hands up, again I'm following my view, um, hands up who, who know what a social enterprise is? Some, most, okay, more than I anticipated, which is great. I just thought I'd make sure we're all on the same page really, so um, before I lose you with, with any jargon. Uh, but just to be clear um, to what, we were, what I'm referring to when I was sort of refer to social enterprises, I put in the, the closest definition the challenge about operating in this space is there isn't any one legal model for a social enterprise. And one of the closest definitions taken from the previously named Department of Business and Innovation is that fundamentally it's a business. So it still is treated and operates in the same way that, that other businesses do. It's just that rather than being set up purely to make money, obviously money's important and it needs it to survive, but it's been set up for primary social purpose. So the purpose of the organisation is to address social cause. Um, the EU sort of expanded upon that definition somewhat to include other characteristics, really, of social enterprises, uh, including limited profit distribution, trying to retain more money within communities, uh, but equally about participatory governance, so therefore allowing more members of the community to have a say in how things are run and how perhaps services and uh, activities are delivered. Um, and it's important to note, really, from the journey of um, supporting the sector in the west of England, but also making the case of why it's important to support social organisations in the west of England, uh, is a number of years ago, um, with the support of our local enterprise partnership, who I believe are very patchy across the country from one area to the next, uh, but in the west of England we managed to lobby for a dedicated subgroup uh, within the LEP, who initially put some resource toward helping map the sector, which was important for a number of reasons. Firstly, just to figure out the scale and the scope of the providers are out there, who they are, where they are, where they're active. Um, but additionally, it was really important to acknowledge the contribution that they make to the local economy. So up in the west of England, we managed to map back in 2013 that there were a contribution of £34 million a year annually brought into that region by social organisations. 
and they employ 10,000 jobs. So sort of talking in business terms, it's quite helpful to understand the scope of their delivery, but equally, the sectors that they're prevalent in. Uh, and I appreciate this won't be the same across the whole of the Southwest, that landscape fluctuates somewhat depending upon uh, your geography. But up in the West of England, we've got a real diversity of social organisations active in almost every traditional industry sector. So therefore, thinking in sort of procurement terms, perhaps not in every single of your departments or contractual obligations, but in, in many of them, you will find social organisations that are ready, willing and interested to be engaged uh, and support the delivery of products or services. I think it's also interesting to note that, in, um, as already been referenced, that in addition to the emphasis on the public sector to expand its work and social value, uh, there's also a corporate challenge. Uh, and corporations have been challenged to spend over a billion pounds in the next few years in social economy organisations. Um, which I think really on the ground is, is, is quite interesting, uh, particularly as, again, referenced the, the need to do more for less, the need to look at innovative ways of um, um, dealing with increasing levels of demand uh, and less budget to, to make things happen. In addition to requesting for additional social value to be delivered, there's increasing opportunities for collaboration. Uh, I'm finding particular, um, particularly the sort of lines are getting very blurred so far as lots of private organisations wanting to increase their social impact and equally lots of charitable organisations wanting to be more enterprising uh, and clearly a slightly shrinking role of, of local government in a number of different localities uh, means that the increasing need for collaboration across sectors is ever so important. Uh, and in fact, just last week in Bristol, we launched a new initiative in collaboration between the local Chamber of Commerce, um, the local community grant um, foundation, a crowdfunding website, uh, and ourselves as a service provider, looking at a sort of innovative collaboration to help to strengthen um, the maturity of the provider market uh, in order to, to try and enable them to be in a better position, really, uh, to deliver and pitch into supply chains um, from yourselves and others. Um, so it feels like it's a really ripe and important time to be uh, exploring and engaging with perhaps non-traditional providers. Um, the challenge that I find and often many uh, colleagues find is just the general level of understanding. People very clearly understand what a business is, they very clearly understand what a charity is, but the sort of space in the middle gets a little bit more confusing because it can take a variety of forms, whether it's cooperatives, trusts, community interest companies, there's a myriad of different models that underpin their efforts. Whereas fundamentally, going back to the characteristics that I referred back to earlier, uh, essentially driving social change very much in their DNA. Um, but in addition to their core value that social enterprises are set up to deliver, for the context of the conversations today, many of them are also delivering additional social value in addition to their social missions. So I put a couple of case studies in, in the slide there, just to sort of illustrate, really, that some of the very traditional sectors that are being challenged uh, and alternative solutions are being provided. So ranging from uh, financial institutions, in Bristol we have a very large credit union that supplies 10,000 members, uh, recycled with profit to increase uh, and sustain its social impact. But in addition to providing core financial services, they go that step further. Uh, and deliver financial inclusion programs, financial literacy programs, and have a number of added value activities on top of their core business uh, to help increase their social value. Uh, another example was the energy sector. Now, interestingly, um, again, a, a very traditional industry that's seeing a lot of growth um, from community-based initiatives. I've worked quite locally with a community who raised uh, through a sort of community share round uh, enough money to set up a local solar farm to help increase revenues into that local community. And I know for a fact Bristol City Council has recently spun out its own community energy company uh, along similar lines to to look to expand uh, their presence within uh, community-led energy development. Uh, a couple of other sectors really just to sort of make reference to. One is uh, uh, food, uh, and I particularly think very relevant here in this sort of part of the world and across the southwest. And increasingly, um, Food providers are being drawn to whether it's the values or whether it's the model of developing social organisations. So again, thinking about some of the uh, types of, of contracts and the types of procurement at your disposal, there were a number of area food providers uh, that increasingly set themselves up as social enterprises. 
Um, one of the biggest social enterprises in Bristol is the Bristol Community Health, which is an NHS spin-out uh, that services 37,000 patients across Bristol every year. Uh, but again, they have a number of uh, additional benefits to their organisation, both in terms of how they're structured uh, and also how they make decisions. It's very much an employee-run organisation, which is very distinctive uh, from an awful lot of other traditional models. Uh, and lastly, in the example, uh, a Bristol Community Shop, which was um, initiated by Community Asset Transfer initially. Um, but in addition to providing um, advice, they've sort of gone on to provide an, uh, a selection of other community services, whether that's fresh food and veg, whether that's employment support, whether that's incubation space for local entrepreneurs. Uh, so again, just to sort of illustrate a number of, of quite traditional sectors, uh, whereby these the social organisations are approaching things a little bit differently. Um, it's worth mentioning again in the sort of introduction of the Act, we've received an awful lot of inquiries um, from, from providers that are uh, sort of scratching their heads and trying to figure out how best to articulate the social value that they're able to deliver uh, and be able to make the best case for presenting themselves in any of your procurement rounds. Um, so one of the things that we initiated at the start of this year was a relationship with the social value business who have developed a dedicated uh, social value quality mark, uh, which is an independent mark that looks at um, trust and the additional social value being uh, generated and created by providers primarily, um, based around the social return on investment principles. Um, but as the sort of quite a tiny slide illustrates there, following a reasonably linear process. So Interventions are delivered, stuff happens, changes the experience and outcomes that are uh, hopefully achieved. People do things differently, impacts are created. Um, we take an approach that uh, looks at the eight areas of strategic community needs assessment and we map impacts against those different areas which enables us to look at various proxies that Guy mentioned, unit cost databases, etc. and look at how much it would cost uh, the local authority otherwise to deliver to help providers particularly either sometimes forecast before they've delivered something obviously most effectively evaluate the impact of their activities on the ground to stand them in a better chance increasing their capacity understanding the ability to pitch and be successful in procurement rounds um, because there is a real challenge and a bit of a skill shortage uh, within our sector particularly, and various range of understanding and expertise uh, across the sector, particularly for pitching into the public sector. So we're trying to provide a supportive role to enable organisations to understand and articulate the impact that they're making, but also ready themselves to engage in process with the private or public sector, uh, because essentially in order to create sustainable development for social economy organisations, and getting themselves into more supply chains is going to be really critical for their development. Um, there's a slide in there about a forum that we set up, which was just uh, an opportunity to learn and share from experiences from providers, suppliers, and commissioners in Bristol, sort of share stories and learn from each other. As you mentioned, this is a very much an evolving space. So, having a forum to be able to share and communicate with each other about best practice, about ideas and examples has been really, really informative. Um, to come back to the question that you posed, in fact, one of our first inquiries um, as soon as we announced a social value support service was actually from a national provider. And the, bro the role of a sort of local brokerage is, is coming through very strongly. Um, and it was actually for, a, for an organisation, a facilities management company, looking at a £6 million boys home contract. They currently don't provide any core social value into their existing business and we're looking for me to point them in the direction of an organisation that they could collaborate with for the purpose of trying to perhaps articulate <coughs> additional value for the purpose of that contract. Uh, and apart from having a tentative conversation about me trying to screen any bid candy from, from the process, which is obviously something which is very important, um, but it was interesting as my first example that the organisation that I introduced and broke them to it was a long-standing charitable organisation that were just looking to set up a new social enterprise around a handyman service. Now, if it wasn't for the Social Value Act and the Social Value Policy that Bristol City Council has, there was no way in the world that this national provider would have any interest in talking to a small startup social enterprise about anything, to be honest. However, because of the scenario that's being placed and because of the emphasis on increasing and demonstrating their social value, 
it provided an opportunity for a local organisation to get in, not in tier one, maybe tier two or three to begin with, but at least engage into the supply chain of a national organisation. And if it wasn't for this legislation or this policy by the council, just simply would not have been in the process for development. So it's very early days, um, but I'm still trying to bang the drum for, uh, for trying to get more social and, and, and small organisations, but not by default. I think there is a very important to say that we shouldn't just, you know, you shouldn't just be awarding contracts. I mean, you can't just award contracts anyway. And um, small and social by default obviously has to go up down to be best fit for the service or the products that you're after. But it is well worth bearing in mind, and I appreciate this point from Guy about it doesn't cost you extra. But I think there is a challenge, from my understanding, talking to other commissioners in Bristol and, and elsewhere, around the scenarios. So the National Housing Federation opened up procurement and invited social enterprises to pitch. But some of the contracts they were looking to award were sort of two to ten million pounds. And there's no local organisation in the area, social or otherwise. There's no small organisation that can fulfil that level of contract. So realistically, you all have to ask yourselves, in order to engage with this sort of market development activities, in order to engage and truly bring small and social organisations into the supply chains, what do you all need to do to make that happen? What smaller lots are going to be needed? Where are the opportunities for you to do so? And I appreciate it might not cost more, but there is a little bit of a time factor and there's a little bit more effort perhaps. I can see the logic. It's much easier, presumably, to award one contract for £10 million to one provider than it is to break that down into 100 lots of £100,000. That's a lot more work for you. So I appreciate there's a slight tension in between the practicalities of uh, procuring the best possible value but equally trying to do best by your community by providing opportunities for them to come on board into the supply chains to increase the impact in the local communities. Um, so with those few thoughts, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank, thank you, Carl. Um, do, do we have questions for Carl on any of those points or um, any questions for any of the other speakers at this moment in time? Um, Carl, I'm certainly interested in the point that you've mentioned about the local brokerage aspect and the angle, I mean, how, how, how or where do you see that role in relation to communities, I mean, from the um, local council's perspective or the organisation's perspective um, in the public sector organisations? You know, is, is it by happy coincidence, for example, that, you know, you, you, you've established um, a, foot, a footfall in Bristol and you know the, the spin-offs then for the local authority or is it by happy coincidence or by design I suppose does it happen organically or yeah I think a bit of both I mean to be to be fair we've been around for a fair while but equally in every one of your localities there is a, a CBS organization operating in your localities that have been supporting community organizations and building a network of um, in Bristol we help set up the Bristol Bar social enterprise network uh, we have uh, a big mailing list of organisations that enables us to act in a brokerage capacity. And similarly, CBS organisations in your locality will do the same. Uh, to add to that, we were kindly invited to join an advisory group uh, with the council to help um, feed in the sort of provider perspective into the development of the policy, implementation of the policy, but equally cascade any information that's of relevance um, and importance to the sort of sector back outward again, because I think it's really important to be communicating and engaging at an earlier stage as possible, really, um, yeah. to try and support the um, organisations to be in the best place, really, to seize the opportunities that are at hand. Sure. Okay, thank you. And any other questions from the floor? If we, I mean, well done to all the speakers so far. You've been pretty much bang on script in terms of your time scale. I know we're 10 minutes um, after where we intended to be, but we were 10 minutes late starting, so, so we're. We're on track. Um, we, we, we may um, catch up time, but there is there's opportunity for, again, hopefully some good discussion after the break as well.